Warning. The following episode contains subject matter and scenes that some viewers may find upsetting, disturbing, or unnerving. Please note, viewer discretion is advised at all times. Sit back and enjoy. This is the Zodiac speaking. I am the killer of two teenagers last Christmas at Lake Herman and the girl last 4th of July. To prove this, I shall state some facts which only I and the police know. Early last Saturday evening, Celia Shepard and Brian Hartnell, both in their early 20s, were sitting on this knoll of land overlooking part of Lake Berryessa. I did think I was going to die, and so from that moment on, one has to have certain goals that you have to set. The first goal, of course, was to live. Here's a cipher, or that is part of one. The other two parts have been mailed to the San Francisco Examiner and the San Francisco Chronicle. They thought they were alone, but there was a third man on this knoll, a man who wore a medieval-style executioner's hood, carried a knife and gun, and intended to use them. He should go to the nearest law enforcement agency and turn himself in, and we will try to do whatever we can to help this man. I want you to print this cipher on your front page. If you do not do this, I will go on a kill rampage that will last the whole weekend. Cruise around and pick off all stray people or couples that are alone. Then move on to kill some more until I've killed over a dozen people. I get awfully lonely when I am ignored. So lonely, I could do my thing. This guy is just a killer, a mad killer, and you have no motive, so it makes it a little bit harder for us to track him down. Hello and welcome back to I Could Murder a Podcast Series 5, Episode 1. What's that coming over the hill? It's Ben Carter. It's Ben Carter. Oh, a monstrous little break we've just got back from. Oh, uh, kill it. Kill it with fire. <laughs> no, how are you doing? Not so bad, not so bad. Uh, well rested, eager to go, eager to get this series under the way. We've got a whole host of interesting episodes. Oh, well, I should bloody well hope so. How long we've had off, Ben? Well, people like to remind us. They do. Um, when you go back, it's nice. It's nice that they want us back. Yeah. It'd be better than going, stay away, stay away. <laughs> but anyway, we are, we are very glad to be back. We're very excited to be back. And this series, we are up in the ante. Mm, big time. We have our very own Dan Cam. Hello, world. How are you doing? Yes, we've got our very own Dan Cam this series, but we're also up in the ante in a different way, aren't we, Ben? That's right. We have our very own resident doctor, Dr. Das of A Psych for Sore Minds, um, who's going to be joining us each week to give more of a clinical uh, overview on each case that we cover. We're very excited to have him on board. So please, if you haven't already, go and check his channel out and please click that surpri- surprise button. <laughs> Don't let it surprise you, though. Click that subscribe button and click our subscribe button if you're new to the channel. And we're thrilled to announce our partnership with Gully Gums and they'll be dressing us for the remainder of the series. Yes, we've been wearing Gully Gums for a long time. A lot of people ask, where'd you get that from? I don't know if they're asking because they, they want us, they want to yeah. be wearing what we're wearing, but well. we're, we're, the Gully Gums gets us. They, they know us and we've, yeah. we've got a nice little discount code as well. Murder20, the link below if you guys get 20% off. Yes, guys, thank you so much for your patience. We did have a little time off, but we feel refreshed. We feel ready. We've got 12 new cases mm-hmm. in in the bag ready for to show you guys and we can't wait to get into them we may well throw a sneaky case vote into the mix so if so be sure to follow us over on instagram which is at could murder a pod we have the same handle uh, for twitter but we usually do in each series a little case vote or a little poll um, over on instagram so if you're not following us already we're quite close to six thousand. it would mean a lot uh, if you gave us a little follow so i don't know if this will be a thing we do every week ben but with what gully garments have kicked us out in maybe a kind of character i can imagine us playing okay. i think i'd be a rich villain on a yacht yeah wearing the shirt i'll probably get dice so shortly after but I've, i'm living it up I'm yeah, a good time. time what do you think your character is uh screaming mafia to me mafia yeah um, <laughs> There's two ways you could go. Go mafia. Okay, yeah. Go on. What's your name? Um, Yoshi Abitsu. <laughs> that was very quick. Yeah, it was very quick. How are you yeah. spelling Abitsu? Um, A B I T S U. Abitsu. <laughs> Yoshi Abitsu. <laughs> I like that. Yoshi, uh, Yoshi a shell suit. That was hard to say, and harder to wear. <laughs> no, it slips in perfectly, and that's the great thing about gully garments. <laughs> um, Use the fucking code. Yeah. Why not? You'll get a killer deal. Murder twenty. We're going to run out. Underboss. 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. Don't have to the bus. <laughs> Yoshi, get the coffees. <laughs> Oh no! I don't know where you, I don't know where you're from, but there you go. Anyway, we are we are very excited to be back. And also, darts player, not darts player. Darts players don't wear this stuff anymore. I'm a evil genius on a yacht. Yeah, all right. Soon to be killed. We've just we've established that. Yoshi dies in the second scene of the TV series. <laughs> so Ben, today's case. We wanted to start series five off with a big who done it, a big mystery. Um, and we think can say a big bang. I was like, it's not that kind of show, Ben. <laughs> Tell the sponsors. No. Yeah, it's a bit different to our normal series opener, but we quite enjoy the, the mysteries, the conspiracies. Um, we, lo- we love a bit of conjecture, um, so we can kind of float between... It means you don't really need to get the facts bang on. Yeah, exactly. Uh, <laughs> um, but, you know, we did the, the mystery of John Bonet Ramsey. We've got a few mystery kind of conspiracy episodes over on our Patreon page as well. Could argue Michael Jackson's uh, mystery. Conspiracy and mystery, yeah. Yeah. Um, we yeah, the, over uh, Patreon. Yeah, we've got, we've got plenty over there on Patreon with the yeah. uh, Smiley Face Murder Theory, yeah. uh, the Ditloff Pass, the uh, Delphi Murders, D.B. Cooper. Yeah, that's a big mystery. Lots of big mysteries yeah, there. There you go. We love a mystery. And that's why we've opted to go with today's case Who Was the Zodiac Killer? I'm intrigued. Do we have the answers? <laughs> I bloody well hope so with that title. And if you're interested in checking out any of those mysteries that Tom just mentioned, why not head over to our Patreon page, which massively supports our channel. We want to say a massive thank you to the people that already support us over there. We have a lovely community on our Patreon page uh, and it just works out at £1 a week. We do case requests and uh, there's 50 odd, a bank, a catalogue of, uh, yeah, of a, episodes over there. That's a full there. bank, isn't it? Yeah, You'd this... be happy if you're a robber and you've got that bank, mm. you're like, oh, we've really struck gold. There you go. And then you will look at the whole content and you're like, oh. <laughs> Maybe a quid a week is a bit steep. No, I'm only kidding. It's great. So before we get into the Zodiac case, Ben, what one thing does all humans have in common? Um, most of us have got, uh, almost all of us have got eyes. <laughs> brain, all got a brain. Are they? Some of them. Yeah. Yeah. No, Ben, it's all, it's that we're all going to die. We're all going to die. And that brings me on to this week's sponsor, Dead Happy. That's right. So the guys over at Dead Happy are shaking things up and have essentially redesigned the way that life insurance works. And I think when you get to our age, Tom, life insurance probably isn't the first thing on your on your list, top of the agenda. Well, it should be, you idiot. Because Dead Happy, they're basing it on the age you are now, not the age you're going to be later on. That's why they're able to do things cheaper, and that's how they're changing the game. So over at Dead Happy, they can understand that life can be a little bit unpredictable. So with that, they can allow you to change your monthly payout to suit your current circumstance. And as well as that, one thing I really like is the no-hassle setup. You so hate hassle. I I, I, the last thing I want in my look, life. This is me giving you a hassle. He hates it. Look at his stupid face. Look at his stupid face. Oh. <laughs> Go red. So to set up a policy with Dead Happy, it only takes a few minutes online. It's nice and straightforward, hassle-free, as I said, which is great. Um, and you just answer four simple health questions. There's no medical involved, no extra calls involved, and you can set up within a few minutes. I'm, I mean, Ben, we're busy, dude. You're part of the low, low down in the mafia. I'm a lot a, of coffees. I'm a yacht-based villain. Yeah. Uh, we haven't got time to be doing this online, but with, with Dead Happy, we can just do that. That, And in our lines of work, yeah. we're probably going to die. <laughs> uh, no, everyone's going to die. And that's the reason yeah. why Dead Happy is so important. Yeah, so why not die happy? So one of the really cool features of Dead Happy is the Death Wish. Uh, and it's a, a place essentially where you can make, store and share your own Death Wish for what you want to happen when you die. Yeah, some examples of some people's wishes on there. Someone wants a Viking funeral, pay off the mortgage, and, you know, kind of sensible stuff like that. Yeah. Ben, do you have a Death Wish? Um, I would like the Lighthouse family to play at my funeral. That'd be quite nice. A lot of money though, isn't it? One, one track. Okay, one track. What, what will that be? High. Is it called High? Because we are gonna be. Ugh. Yeah. Oh, God. Apparently not very good live. Great. But you'll be dead anyway, so yeah, <laughs> there exactly. you go. Yeah. So why not head over to deadhappy.com, sort your life out by entering the code MURDER for three months free. Sort your fucking life out before you tell them what to do. Idiot. So as Tom said, we love a good mystery, um, and we've picked one of the biggest in the world to start this series off with, and that is the mystery of who was the Zodiac. Fuck it. It's his, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> the disappointment in your face, Tom. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. No, because he was great. He was doing so well. It was good. Thanks. And he shat his pants. Well. And then the nativity play. <laughs> Gold frankincense and... <laughs> So as Tom mentioned, we love a good mystery and we thought, what better mystery to start this series off than the mystery of who is the Zodiac Killer? Talking about mysteries, Ben, the other day was the first time you played Cluedo. How did you find it? Well, that's the thing. I mean, I don't want to go ahead and get this case solved, but played three games, lost the first two, won the third. Oh, that's right. So One out of three. 
Yeah. Is bad. That's not bad, guys. 33% right. success rate. I mean, the first two games, I was just learning the ropes. Guess the or the uh, candlesticks. Huh? huh? Oh. Did right. you Yeah. <laughs> Who's your favourite character? Uh, I was Miss Scarlet. Oh. Mm-hmm. Did you pick or did you just get? Uh, I, I, I like the colour. You colour blind? Uh, Colonel Mustard. That's the best one. Yeah. And there's a new character, Dr. Orchid. Is it actually? In, in the one I got, yeah. Oh, it's the, fut- it's the futuristic one. Kind of, yeah. The new up-to-date one. Yeah. Simpsons, uh, Cluedo. Great fun. Is it? I think I've played it. See, in this case, there's lots to unpack. There's mm. lots of theories. There's lots of conspiracies. There's lots of letters. There's lots of different shapes. Yeah, 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 yeah. absolutely. Loads I mean, of shapes. Probably too, he could have, or they, Ooh. or she. It's been described as the most famous unsolved case in American history. Um, there's lots to unpack, loads to get into. We're going to talk about, uh, well, we're going to present as much of the facts that we can then present the possible suspects, which I'm very excited to do with you. We've got a beefy timeline to go through. And we both love the movie, which, you know, we agree on. Yeah, I didn't watch it for research for this because, again, like I said before, never all good for research watching the films. You, can, you start thinking this happened when yeah. it didn't. Watch it twice. Yeah. Um, <laughs> you like to have fun. Yeah. I love it. Love a bit of fun. Obviously, with our other cases, we can usually go through the childhood and all that stuff, but we don't know, or do we, who actually committed this crime so we're going to do it slightly differently today we're going to go through some crimes which weren't originally associated with um the zodiac killer but later on was put in the timeline so we're going to go into that beforehand and then yeah. go into the kind of more known timeline yeah and there's been some very recent light shed on the case and a lot of people were very happy to tag us and message us about that during the middle of kind of series four um so we're going to talk about that as well it's still an open case it's never been officially closed though some might argue with that and uh, yeah very excited to start the series with a big old juicy mystery so we're going to go back all the way to the late 1960s san francisco bay area a lot is going on between this particular or there was a 10 month period that the zodiac appears to have been most active in or that's the most kind of condensed period that they 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 tie it down to but there was a it was a lot going on in california at the time and a lot going on in america at the time a lot going on in the world at the time a lot of the documentaries and podcasts that uh, i listened to a lot of the articles i read suggested that the zodiac was kind of one of the first serial killers that they had to deal with but there was actually a lot more going on at the time so ed kemper had just uh killed his grandparents so he was being rehabilitated but at the time in california there were a lot of other killers on uh the prowl there was vaughn greenwood the skid row slasher patrick kearney the trash bag killer and also known as the freeway killer there was also the manson family murders all operating out of california that year so there was a lot going on well that's freeway as in road not as in three different have sex bring a friend freeway but this case does stand out an awful lot because it was just it is just filled with so much mystery. And Ben's going to go into a bit more now what else was going on at that time. It does sound like a very hectic time to yeah. be alive and living in North America. Yeah, a lot going on between this particular year. So between 1968 and 1969, there's a really uh, kind of morbid quote from the San Francisco Chronicle, which we'll, we'll, we'll talk about more uh, in more detail shortly. Um, they state, among all the rocky years of the mid to late 60s, 1968 was the rockiest. The news, which was mostly bad, never stopped. The counterculture movement, as well as the Vietnam War, was very much at its peak. There was a state strike of San Francisco. Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. was shot and killed outside of his hotel room. Seven days of riots follow in major US cities. Pop artist Andy Warhol got shot. Senator Robert F. Kennedy is shot three times with a 22 caliber pistol just past midnight at the Ambassador Hotel in Los Angeles after delivering his victory speech in the California Democratic primary. His final public words are, it's on to Chicago and let's win there. He is pronounced dead 26 hours after he is shot. So there's a huge amount going on in California. There's a huge amount going on in America. There's a lot going on in the world. During this year, obviously, there's a mysterious individual or group of individuals lurking about the Bay Area and uh, the crimes of which still remain kind of unsolved, unaccounted for to this day. Yeah, and we're going to get into now some of the uh, crimes that have been linked with the Zodiac Killer after the fact. It wasn't a direct link to early stages. I thought maybe this was kind of him practicing his kind of craft, seeing what, could, seeing how far he could push things, and then it's later on been linked to him. So we're going to get into those possible victims. So as we mentioned, this case is full of conjecture 
nature and very strongly held beliefs. There are three additional potential victims of the Zodiac Killer. These have been speculated due to the time, method and location of the killings. The other murders and attacks may have been the work of the Zodiac, but none of these three victims have been confirmed as Zodiac victims. So the first two victims are 18 year old Robert Domingos and 17 year old Linda Faye Edwards, and they were both shot and killed on the 4th of June, 1963, whilst the couple were together on a secluded beach near Gaviota. There are some very distinct similarities between the attack on this pair as with the Zodiac's confirmed attack that would occur at Lake Berryessa five years later. That's the thing as well. So the, we're going to talk <clears> a lot about the ciphers and the, the letters and the cards that were sent, uh, information left at various crime scenes. Um, and there's one particular letter where I believe they can't prove that it was from the Zodiac, but it's alleged to have been the Zodiac, where he claims to have had a, 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 at least 37 victims. But what we're going to cover here and uh, is the ones that are closest tied to be potential Zodiac victims. So the other one is 18-year-old Cherie Jo Bates, which is actually in itself quite a famous unsolved murder case. She was stabbed to death to the point where she was almost decapitated on the 30th of October 1966 at the Riverside City College. The particular connection to the Zodiac came about almost four years after her murder had happened when San Francisco Chronicle reporter Paul Avery, who we're going to go on to discuss in more detail later, received a tip regarding similarities between the Zodiac killings and the circumstances surrounding Sherry's murder. Basically, there was an eyewitness that claimed a young male was lurking in the shadows while she was studying, um, watching Bates study for many hours. This eyewitness claimed that it was a young white male and she was then murdered shortly after this individual was noted to be hiding in the shadows. She was found to have been repeatedly stabbed in her chest and left shoulder and suffered several deep slash wounds to her face and neck, which is again a pattern that we'll see in some of the other confirmed Zodiac murders. December 20th, 1968, 17-year-old David Faraday and 16-year-old Betty Lou Jensen were sitting in David's car in a gravel parking area near Lake Herman Road in Vallejo, which was a well-known lover's lane. Lover's lane. Have you ever been to a lover's lane? Yes. It was on a roundabout. Ooh, so, what? <laughs> yeah. So That's like, not a lane. Well, no, you'll know where it is as well. You know... Go on. <laughs> no, we weren't there together. Eat. Well, there's two exits to this roundabout, which is basically like a... Uh, what makes it? What makes it? What makes it a lover's lane? Well, the rest of the roundabout, there's like parking to the side of the roundabout, and it's quite dark, and it's like it's next to the motorway, so it's super romantic, like seeing these lights washing past. I think it's just you and to go and dogging. <coughs> Essentially, no, no, a dark seedy car, car park. I was inside the car the whole time, and they're watching you. No one was watching. <laughs> Who was there? Did you wake? <laughs> 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 Put on some David Gray. Um, <laughs> <laughs> they were. Torch shined through. Yeah. Just as silhouette. Just as you. F that was an avenue we didn't need to go down. <laughs> no, yeah. <laughs> Lovers Lane. That road was closed. <laughs> Dirty wanker. Go on. <laughs> The pair were on their first date and had attended a Christmas concert at the local high school. At around 10pm, another car entered the parking area. The car stayed for a few moments and then disappeared. A few moments later, the car returns and the driver exits the car and approaches David and Betty Lou. He fires two warning shots into the car with a 22 caliber semi-automatic pistol. David and Betty Lou tried to exit the car through the passenger side and escape, but David was shot in the head as he tried to flee. Betty Lou also tries to escape, but is shot five times in the back. The shooter gets back into his car and drives away. About an hour later, Stella Borges finds the bodies, having left her ranch 1.5 miles west of the crime scene. She then sped off to alert local police, who arrive at the scene at 11.28pm. The police report said she states that no cars were going in either direction while she was on the road. When she arrived at the scene, headlights picked up the car and she observed the boy and he looked like he had fallen out of the open door. The girl was lying on her side facing the road. She had a purple dress on and looked well dressed. She saw only one car at the scene. It looked like a Rambler greyish in colour. It had a chrome rack on the top. She states she drove 60 or 70 miles an hour en route to Benicia to report the incident. When she saw the police car, she honked her horn and blinked her lights to attract the attention of the police officers. You want to be careful doing that down a lover's lane. <laughs> you learned that lesson before? Yeah, the hard way. Mr. Wickham. <laughs> 
David was initially found to be breathing by local police and was rushed to the hospital but was pronounced dead on arrival at Vallejo Hospital. Betty Lou was found dead at the scene due to the severity of her injuries. When investigating the murders, police discovered that another local couple, William Crow and his girlfriend, were parked in the exact same spot as the victims at around 9pm. He reported that just before 10pm, he and his girlfriend were parked facing towards the road when they noticed another car coming towards them. Just after it had passed, by the turning it braked sharply and started reversing back towards them. William, fearing that something wasn't right, decided to leave immediately, started his car and headed off in the direction of nearby Benicia, only to be followed by the vehicle tailgating his rear bumper. He drove towards the freeway and at the last minute turned off, managing to lose the car behind him. The original reports state that the car in question was a blue Valiant, but William is adamant in his retelling of the story he has always stated that it was a light-coloured Chevy. Other reports of passers-by described a light-coloured Chevy alongside another car at the time of the murders, and shots being heard from a quarter of a mile away at 10pm. I know the uh, Zodiac's MO changes throughout, but him actually actively chasing down a car, driving behind it, tailgating it, yeah. doesn't seem very Zodiac-y. No. Scatty. Yeah, but maybe maybe because this, well, as we said, the crimes we just mentioned possibly are his first crimes, but if this yeah. was his first one, maybe he just didn't know what Testing to the waters. Yeah. So obviously Betty Lou's only 16 at this time, and, and like a sad fact was this was the first date she was actually allowed to go on ever with David, and both Betty Lou and David were both very well liked at their school, very popular, very clever. When Once this news came out, people did immediately have a suspect in mind, someone that David had an argument with because they, they liked Betty Lou as well. But the police were very quick to kind of say he wasn't culpable of these crimes. And then after that, they kind of were at a bit of a loose end as to who committed this and as to why this crime was committed. Yeah. And as we said at the start, this case is fueled by conjecture. We're not certain for sure if this was or wasn't the first Zodiac murders, but sources have speculated that the Zodiac was not responsible for these murders because no taunting letters or phone calls were received until months after the murders. But at the same time, if they are his first murders and he hasn't quite decided in his head am i doing letters <laughs> it's a bit like isis how they claim everything yes but never before it happens always after yeah, you can't claim it if it hasn't happened you can make a bold prediction yeah no not that but um <laughs> it's like yeah isis would often say we oh yeah we were responsible for this yeah. uh, there's some people that think because the zodiac is such a um egotistical maniac he claims uh, a lot of these crimes which he didn't actually commit it's just oh yeah I did that as well yeah well that's unsolved <laughs> you know why because I did it but uh, we'll get onto that a bit more later on 4th of July 1969 Darlene Ferrin a 22 year old married woman and Mike Mago, a 19 year old were parked in Blue Rock Springs parking lot it was Independence Day and the parking lot had at least three other cars including a group of kids letting off firecrackers the car soon left and the couple were alone only to be joined about five minutes later by a brown car, possibly a light brown Ford Mustang or Chevrolet Cover, who pulled up alongside them and turned off their headlights. The car left again shortly after. Darlene got a look at the driver. When Mike asked who it was, she said, oh, never mind. That's not the answer you want. Well, for me, that makes me think Darlene knows who that is, yeah. Yeah, which adds to the mystery, Ben. Oh, never mind. The car returned five to ten minutes later and pulled up directly behind them. The driver got out of the car with a flashlight and a 9mm semi-automatic handgun. Darlene and Mike assumed that this was a police officer in an unmarked car and got their identification ready. As he approached the car, the driver began shooting, with five shots being fired through the passenger side window. Darlene was shot at point blank range, but Mike was able to climb into the back of the vehicle. The shooter turned around and started to walk back to the car. However, Mike then let out a scream for help and the shooter returned and shot them another two times. The shooter walked calmly back to his car, whilst Mike fought to exit the car to get help. At 12.40am, Vallejo police received a call notifying them of the shooting and claiming to be the shooter. The caller said, I want to report a murder. If you go one mile east on Columbus Parkway, you will find kids in a brown car. They were shot with a 9mm Luger. I also killed those kids last year. Goodbye. So that was what I was also thinking just off the bat there. The fact that he's referring to his victims as kids implies that he may be a slightly older individual. Mm -hmm. But a lot of the eyewitness or surviving eyewitness statements would, would kind of paint it as a younger white male mystery. But when if you were a kid, would you refer to someone else as a kid? Mm -hmm. If I was a baby and I could talk and there's another baby in the room and someone asked me, who's that with you? There's another baby. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know if that could be used as evidence in this case, but if it can, you're welcome. 
it answers some questions. Thank you. Police soon attended the scene, and although the shooter was long gone, they were able to save Mike's life, despite him having been shot in the face, neck, and chest. He was also able to give a description of his attacker as a 26 to 30 year old, five foot eight male with short, light brown, curly hair. Darlene was slumped at the wheel on the police's arrival at the scene. One of the detectives recalls she mumbled something indiscernible. Despite Darlene receiving extensive CPR from the ambulance crew, she was pronounced dead on arrival at the local hospital. So if I was sat down in a car and someone walked to my car window, I don't think I'd be very accurate at saying the height. Yeah, and also the thing about torches in the dark, you can't often see what's behind them. Oh, yeah. fuck, Brian Cox in the room. There we go, yeah. yeah. So you don't know anymore? Um, <laughs> well, thinking about fires, they're really warm. But yeah, five eight. I think if I sat in a car and Danny DeVito walked to the door, I'd be like, He's about six foot six. <laughs> no, I wouldn't be that dumb. I do think Darlene holds the key here because she mutters something when she's trying, trying to say something, which, I mean, that could be, you know, tell my husband I loved him or whatever. Yeah. But the fact that she said as well, oh, never mind, with the passenger in past. That's not what you want to hear. If you're, you know, down Lover's Lane with a young lady and... It's not being said that she's down there cheating on the husband. That's not her husband. No, the movie implied it. Again, again, don't do your Stop research. taking your fucking research from the movie, Ben. But then again, she's with a younger lad, middle of nowhere, dark night. She wasn't admit by herself, though. They went to a place where other people were, and oh, then yeah. the cars left. Oh, I watched yeah. a documentary with her husband on, because he worked at the pancake house that they worked at. He was the chef. She was the waitress. Apparently, she was very chay. She was all get all the tips, and all the other waitresses hated her for it. I don't know whether they just didn't say it in the documentary to mug off the husband. Well, yeah, okay. But, but it, either way, even if they were there as friends... Um, he, he, oh, he, never he, mind. he had something to tell her, apparently. I remember oh, hearing right, that. Yeah. Which that, probably was along the lines of, I'm in love that. with you. Your oh. husband's pancakes are iffy yeah. at best. At the scene, evidence was also collected, including fingerprints, and tips flooded in once the killings made the papers. So straight away, like they normally do, they suspect possibly the, the spouse of the husband. So her husband, Dean, was a suspect. However, he was ruled out because it was established he was at the restaurant cooking pancakes. And um, Darlene's first husband, James Phillips, Crabtree, was also briefly a suspect. So after this crime occurred, Darlene's mother came forward and said that actually she believed Darlene could predict the future a little bit because the night before she went to see Mike and go, go on their little trip, she said, you might read about me in the papers tomorrow, a few hours before she died. But I kind of think that's a case of, she thinks Mike's probably a bit sketchy. Mm. And she jokingly said, I don't think she was like, psychically, you might read about me in the papers tomorrow. Yeah, Mike said he's got something to tell me. I think that's just a throwaway comment of her being a bit sassy, yeah. wait, sassy waitress. Like, hey, yeah. she's a bit dodgy. But yeah, I do think Darlene knew more. Yeah. Yeah, and miraculously, Mike survives. There'll be more about Mike shortly. July 31st, 1969, the killer sends the San Francisco Examiner, Chronicle, and the Vallejo Times Herald letters and separate parts of a trinity of ciphers that would become known as the 408 cipher. 408 being the number of symbols in total. That's a lot of symbols. So Ben, let's pretend I don't know what a cipher is. Can you explain to me what that is? Uh, Cypher is essentially... It's a I, Pokemon, isn't it? Cypher! Cypher! No, but seriously, what is it? Uh, so Cypher, I believe, is essentially a collection of information that requires decoding or coding. Uh, Dan, do you know what Cypher is? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, Ben was on the right tracks. So it's, a, it's, a, it's a message that's put into secret... Uh, Codes. Uh, coding, yeah. Yeah, so like, like, if you decipher something, you're trying to work something else. It's basically like a, a hidden message in, coded into something. Yeah. The letters were handwritten and signed with a symbol of a vertical cross over a circle. Kind of looks like a, a gun arrow or a pointer of a gun. I don't. I'm a, not gun a gun arrow. A sight? Thank you. <laughs> you play COD? Never. Well, yes, prop, you do. Prop, prop hunt. Prop you hunt. do play it, though. I only play prop hunt. That's not the That's same. That's not guns, isn't it? Well, you use guns, but you shoot props. The letters were handwritten and signed with a symbol of a vertical cross over a circle. The logo is also used on Zodiac brand watches. Although with a slight difference in phrasing, all three letters had a similar message. The first one, sent to the Vallejo Times Herald, said, Dear Editor, I am the killer of two teenagers last Christmas at Lake Herman and the girl last 4th of July. To prove this, I shall state some facts which only I and the police know. Christmas. 1. Brand name of ammo, Super X. 2. 10 shots fired. 3. Boy was on back, feet to car. 4. 
Girl was lying on right side, feet to west. 4th of July. 1. Girl was wearing patterned pants. 2. Boy was also shot in knee. 3. Brand name of ammo was Weston. Here is a cipher, or that is part of one. The other two parts have been mailed to the SF Examiner and the SF Chronicle. I want you to print this cipher on your front page by Friday afternoon, August 1, 69. If you do not do this, I will go on a kill rampage Friday that night that will last the whole weekend. I will cruise around and pick of all stray people or couples that are alone, then move on to kill someone until I have killed over a dozen people. All three letters were riddled with spelling errors and claimed responsibility for the murders through details that only the police knew. However, the letter to the San Francisco Chronicle newspaper differed from the other two, in that the writer specifically stated, in this cipher is my identity. A lot of people have argued that they were intentional spelling errors to kind of make it a slightly more complex cipher. Yeah, I mean, if you've if you got a crossword, Ben, mm. and it's not spelled correctly... That's going to take ages. It's taking me an extra 45 minutes. Yeah. Well, I was about to say, my wee books has gone cold, but... <laughs> it's all slushy. Soggy. Soggy. S- slushy yeah. as well. Yeah, either or. Yeah. Some people were thinking maybe he's trying to hide his intelligence. Mm-hmm. Other people have said, pointed out the fact that he got some longer, more complicated words, bang on, but it's kind of, kind of more simple words it was getting incorrect. Yeah. So at the time, it was much more um, common to deliver communication verbally rather than written. Um, and that's why it may have been more common for someone to make spelling errors. So the Zodiac Killer would probably prefer a voice note than writing yeah. a WhatsApp. Yeah. yeah. Probably do that for a four-minute message. You're like, oh. Thank God there's a 1.5 speed. The 4th of August, 1969, until now the killer had not signed any of his letters with a name. This changed when he sent a three-page letter to the San Francisco Examiner, starting with, This is the Zodiac speaking. The examiner immediately turned the letter over to the FBI for comparison against the previous letters. The FBI files in this letter explicitly state that the correspondence was undated and sent anonymously. In the absence of any dated or postmarked envelope, this strongly indicates that this letter was hand-delivered by the killer to the offices of the examiner. Which is risky. Yeah. And one thing about the Zodiac Killer in these cases, he does a lot of things which... Cocky. Yeah, I've got... I keep... I feel like I've said this about another case we covered, but there are some things I've read about this case where I'm thinking, right, wow. He's, you know, the ciphers, um, the letters, but then he also makes a lot of very simple mistakes, which we'll go on to talk about. Well, none of the mistakes got him caught, so... Well, yeah, absolutely. But the point is, he made the mistakes... the, The mistakes, did he make them on purpose? I think he's just doing things to be... Oh, okay. Arrogant. So as the other letter demanded that the cipher was printed on the front page of the paper, it was, um, in order to prevent that rampage from happening. And this letter now was in response to a quote next to that print, where the Vallejo police were saying, we're not satisfied that this letter was written by the murderer and requested the writer send a second letter with more facts to prove his identity. The Zodiac killer obliged, also writing, by the way, are the police having a good time with the code? Signing the bottom line of the letter with the Zodiac watch symbol again, as well as writing no address so this is the other letter that he wrote dear editor this is the zodiac speaking in answer to your asking for more details about the good times i've had in vallejo i shall be very happy to supply even more material by the way are the police having a good time with the code if not tell them to cheer up when they do crack it they will have me on the 4th of july i did not open the car door the window was rolled down already The boy was originally sitting in the front seat when I began firing. When I fired the first shot at his head, he leaped backwards at the same time, thus spoiling my aim. He ended up in the back seat, then the floor in the back thrashing out very violently with his legs. That's how I shot him in the knee. I did not leave the scene of the killing with squealing tyres and racing engine, as described in the Vallejo paper. I drove away quite slowly, so as not to draw attention to my car. The man who told police that my car was brown was a negro about 40 to 45, rather shabbily dressed. I was in this phone booth having some fun with the Vallejo cop when he was walking by. When I hung up the phone, the damn thing began to ring and that drew his attention to me and my car. Last Christmas In that episode, the police were wondering how I could shoot and hit my victims in the dark. They did not openly state this, but implied this by saying it was a well-lit night. I could see silhouettes on the horizon. Bullshit. That area is surrounded by high hills and trees. What I did was tape a small pencil flashlight to the barrel of my gun. If you notice, in the centre of the beam of light, if you aim at a wall or ceiling, you will see a black or dark spot in the centre of the circle of light about three to six inches across. 
When taped to a gun barrel, the bullet will strike in the centre of the black dot in the light. All I had to do was spray them, as if it was a water hose. There was no need to use the gun sights. I was not happy to see that I did not get front page coverage. So one thing to note is that the Zodiac replied almost immediately to that request um, and the eagerness to support his claims of being the killer may have led to his hand delivering of the letter directly to the examiner's offices. So as Tom said, a very bold route to decide to deliver it by hand. Again, to use the WhatsApp analogy, yeah. so you're asking a question, he's straight in. Yeah. What, you guys Read fancy, the question. Yeah, you guys are fancy drinks next week? Yes. All right, mate. He's not. He's not a cool guy. Chill out. <laughs> he, he, he seems to be loving the attention. Obviously, wanting to be printed in the front of the paper. Wanting to trying to. He's trying to be clever. Like, oh, no one's going to figure out this uh, cipher. And also thinking that the police. You know, he loves the idea of people struggling with it and how. You know, he's goading the police. Yeah, yeah. Supporting the hand delivery theory, the no address on the bottom of the letter lines up perfectly when folded at the top of the letter. For someone that made so many mis mistakes with the spelling. Um, it's good at folding. Very good at folding, yeah. Maybe when in class he wasn't listening to spelling, he was just making paper airplanes. Origami. So basically, if the letter had no envelope, it would be what the recipient first see. You know, if you like write a secret message on the inside of an envelope just to... No. Got you. No. I mean, you should try it. You might. But basically, yeah, it would have been the first thing the recipient saw when opening the, the envelope. No address. Not very exciting. You can get a bit more zesty than that if you wanted to, like, you know, see it. Like Make so. me at the roundabout. <laughs> August 8th, 1969, the Vallejo Police Department received a call at 6.30pm from high school teachers Donald and Betty Harden, who believed they had solved the 408 cipher. Their interpretation of the cipher read, I like killing people because it is so much fun. It is more fun than killing wild game in the forest because man is the most dangerous animal of all. To kill something gives me the most thrilling experience. It is even better than getting your rocks off with a girl. The best part of it is that when I die, I will be reborn in paradise and all the blank I have killed will become my slaves. I will not give you my name because you will try to slow down or stop my collecting of slaves for my afterlife. However, this left 18 characters over. There has been some speculation as to why this is. The interpretation did not reveal the Zodiac Killer's name as promised in the letters, so these final characters could reveal who he is. Although in this interpretation it says he won't reveal this. Another suggestion is that these are just additional characters to create symmetry in the grid. There's a newer suggestion that this was actually just human error, and when translating this into code, the Zodiac may have left out a whole line. Zodiac expert Dave Oranchak suggests that there is another line above line 17 that was missed off as both start with the same letter E. He suggests that the line would be changed to all the alone and stray people I have killed, rather than all the I have killed, based on previous known correspondences and the continued use of killing people or killing lone people. So one interesting thing about Donald and Betty and how they kind of figured things out was they thought the killer was very narcissistic from writing these notes and that he would be writing I a lot. So they just kind of took a wild guess that the first thing would be I. So that's where they kind of figured out the first letter. And then they thought, what's the what two letters are most commonly put together in writing? It's the L's. So from that, they got all, they basically got all the I's and all the L's from that. And I think they kind of took a stab with killing with K at the beginning. So they started kind of doing it from that, which is very satisfying to think of. Yeah. It's a bit of a strange one because, because it did, you know, it took, it took very clever people, um, some time, like I think it was 23 hours. They spent all 20 hours ish looking at it and figuring it out. That was a long time for it, considering, um, and other stuff as he goes on to write, you know, took years upon years upon well, years. That's it. Yeah. There's, it's what, 50 odd years later and <clears> there's still, yeah, well, being believe, speculated yeah. on at least, but yeah. um, it's it's very interesting um, how they figured it out, and it's it does beg the question: is you know, did he make these mistakes on purpose? Is it just because there's hidden messages that haven't, he hasn't been solved properly? Has yeah, is it human error? Obviously, said with the spelling mistakes, you know, and all those things kind of come into play there. So, the 10th of August, 1969, a letter was received the day after the article from a concerned citizen uh, saying a murder code is broken. Featured in the San Francisco Chronicle newspaper, it says, Dear Sergeant Lynch, I hope the enclosed key will prove to be beneficial to you in the connection with the cipher letter writer. Working puzzles, cryptograms, and word puzzles is one of my pleasures. Please forgive the absence of 
my signature or name as I do not wish to have my name in the papers and it could be mentioned by a slip of the tongue. With best wishes, concerned citizen. With the card came a sheet of paper showing a substitute key to the 408 cipher rather than the literal translation. The term cipher letter writer was also used in the Chronicle article on the deciphering the day before, suggesting that the writer knew that the cipher had already been solved. Then why would you send a letter? Some have suggested that it is from the Zodiac. It may have been the start of his game with both the newspapers and police. There's also a slight differentiation from the Hardens interpretation, adding the letters K and L could be substituted for the Q-shaped symbol, as well as Hardens correctly guessed F and M, so could this be the Zodiac clarifying their mistake? It also rules out the Hardens as sending this helpful key in afterwards, as also they've already had their name in the press about it, so why wouldn't they want a responsibility of doing this as well? Analysis of the typography of the type letter was conducted and fingerprints lifted from the envelope, however no matches have been found and the typography analysis produced no leads other than a slightly defective letter A on the typewriter. Handwriting analysis was also conducted from the envelope and compared to previous Zodiac letters as well as the Hardens writing however the results were inconclusive. September 27th 1969, 22 year old Cecilia Shepard and 20 year old Brian Hartnell, two Pacific Union college students were enjoying a picnic at Lake Barriessa in a remote location by Twin Oak Ridge. At around 6.15pm, Cecilia became aware of a man 300 yards away watching them. She ignored him, but looked up again a few moments later and saw that he was now only about 100 yards away. She told Brian, but when she looked over again, the man had disappeared. The man then stepped out from behind the tree wearing what looked like a black executioner's mask, black overalls with the now famous zodiac sign on a bib-like garment on the front and clip-on glasses over his mask. Some people have alleged that the glasses may have been prescription um, to link to the uh, composite as well. Um, Very clever if it's not prescription, it's just to hide your your eyes. Some have alleged been sunny. Could have just been sunny. Leaving his house alone. Don't forget your sunglasses. I washed that sack last week. The man was fast approaching them with a gun and claimed to be an escaped convict from either Montana or (laughs) Colorado. They're like, where? (laughs) Make off. You fucking idiot. Fuck off. (laughs) (laughs) The man was now fast approaching them with a gun and claimed to have been an escaped convict from either Montana or Colorado who had just killed a prison guard and needed money and a car to flee to Mexico. Brian immediately offered his wallet and car keys and spoke to him for a few minutes trying to establish a rapport. This didn't work, however, and the man forced Cecilia to tie Brian up with a plastic clothesline. Brian told Cecilia that he thought he could try and grab the man's gun, but Cecilia told him not to risk it. The man then stepped a few paces back so that the gun was out of reach and their chance had passed. He then tied Cecilia up and took the clip out of the gun to show Brian it was fully loaded. So basically, and again to refer back to the movie, this scene is really intense and it's, it's quite a watch. It's alleged that Brian didn't view him as a threat even when he saw the gun. So he was kind of laughing and joking with Cecilia saying, oh, it's just a guy He's probably gone behind the trees to, to go for a go to the toilet. And then he's appeared with a gun and it just got a bit more serious. So Brian essentially then asked uh, this man to, you know, prove that the gun was actually loaded. He said, I have to ask, you know, was it even loaded? And uh, that's when he revealed a full chamber. The man, seeing that Cecilia hadn't tied Brian up tight enough, then retied him, ensuring that he couldn't escape. He then stabbed Brian six times in the back and Cecilia ten times in both her back and abdomen as she rolled around trying to avoid the blade. Brian feigned death, lowering his breathing in an attempt to avoid his attacker returning to finish off the job. It worked and the attacker casually walked away towards the hillside trail. There's a lot of casual walking and calm walking. I was just thinking that. Yeah. So you picture the scene, they're both there, they've both been stabbed many times, Um, terrifying, the killer's left now. He manages to use his teeth to actually undo her hand ties, and he manages to to wriggle free, you know, severely wounded, lost lost a lot of blood, he tries to clamber his way, you know, from that space, he's a long way from the road. In the middle of nowhere, yeah. Yeah, um, and he kind of eventually just kind of passes out when he does that. But luckily at 6.30pm a fisherman heard the couple screaming and alerted park rangers. So just before 7.40pm the Napa Police Department received a call from a man claiming responsibility for the attack, saying, I want to report a murder. No, a double murder. They are two miles north of park headquarters. They were in a white Volkswagen Carmen Kia. I'm the one that did it. 
The call was quickly traced to the phone booth in downtown Napa and fingerprints were recovered. But that's one of the things, using a public phone, there's like so many fingerprints on there, it's just going to muddy the waters there. By the time the rangers arrived, Cecilia and Brian had managed to untie the restraints, but both were in critical conditions. The rangers also found at the scene the zodiac symbol and the message, Vallejo 12 2068 7 4 69 Sept 27 69 630 by knife identifying the previous murders written on Brian's car door. And just on this as well, there's a very famous interview with Brian Hartnell literally days after this attack. It's the most remarkable thing to watch because he's been interviewed in his hospital bed and he's just so, he has no resentment over what's happened. He's so calm uh, and composed and he, he even says, he even apologises for saying, using the word sick as in mentally. He's just so polite and um, calm about the whole thing. It's quite... Yeah. Are you putting him as a suspect? No, not at all. Just like you are. I've ruled him out. I considered him a robber. I had absolutely no thought uh, that he was anything but that. And when we were at this robbery stage, I didn't consider any real threat to my life or to, or to the girl yeah. or anything. I really didn't consider this, but I, I really wanted to help him. And uh, he did didn't. He, did he seem as though he would like your help at all? No, he didn't. And he didn't even end up taking the money. But he. he I, I Bear no grudge. Well, of course not. Uh, I don't. I don't think that that he was acting under his co- total complete uh, t- total complete consciousness. And uh, uh, when a man is, if if you don't mind using the word sick, uh, you can't you can't hold this against them. But the, the real concern that I have is that he doesn't do this again. I would like. I uh, I'd like to see some people save this this experience. The deputy that found the car reported, I began a search for evidence and discovered a footprint that led from Berryessa Knoxville Road to the victims and then back again, which was totally separate from the shoes that they were wearing. When I went to the roadway, I saw a white Carmen Gia and saw tracks leading away from it. I looked at the Carmen Gia and on the passenger door, the circle with the vertical and horizontal line through it was displayed on the door and there were several dates. And then it ended with September 27th, 1969, 6.30 p.m. by knife, which was our crime. So he had left his calling card, which was what he had done. I recognized the symbol on the door as being the same symbol she had described to be on the killer's hood. Also with this one, when I'm watching documentaries and other things about it, I just think it screamed copycat rather than because it was so, so public, wasn't it? So All public, and like going from the kind of being like you know the little symbol at the end of a letter to wearing a big old like uh, described like a bib thing of it. It just seems to be so over the top. It could be uh, the whole disassociation thing. So him creating mm, this a character, yeah. yeah, this this second life, and then it kind of dehumanizes that aspect yeah, that's true I just felt like it was just seemed to be so and even kind of the backstory why are you telling this backstory I think it could be arrogance if you're playing up to the idea that you know I'm the Zodiac Killer because you're wearing that thing and you're wearing it you know the symbol that's been now reported on it and, and you know the letters have been have been printed in the paper then you're wearing that symbol and you go in there and you're like oh I've just escaped prison and it's like why it just seems to be all very ill thought out and not really I don't know. Because other, other crimes he does, it seems to be very calculated and very smooth with how he does it. Mm-hmm. And this one just seems to be so blatant. Maybe, yeah. maybe that ties into the idea some people say that there's more than one person, but it just seems like there's yeah. a Zodiac's idiot brother had a go. <laughs> Slodiac. But also as well, good, he's good. not as clinical. Mm. So at two of the scenes now, half of the victims survived. For someone as cunning and but does he does he want them to survive? Well, that's again, yeah. Because then it adds to the mystery, adds to who wants because he wants the papers to know the crimes were his. He wants there to be you know reports of how he did it and what exactly he was doing. He probably wanted it to be reported what he was wearing. Exactly, and and how would that be achieved if both of them died? No but, one would have seen he, him in the outfit. But then he did report a double murder. It took nearly an hour for an ambulance to arrive. Whilst at the scene, police officials got descriptions of the attacker and the attack from the victims. At almost 9pm, the ambulances had arrived at Queen of the Valley Hospital with both victims. However, Cecilia died of her injuries two days later. So in that time, she was, she was able to help kind of establish a description and everything like that as well, which was very helpful to the police. You know, even in such as like, she was yeah. obviously so, you know, well, at death's door essentially, but she still kind of 
plucked up the strength to, do, to help in the situation. Along with fingerprints from the phone booth, evidence found at the crime scene included a size 10 and a half wing walker shoe prints and a description from Brian of a killer, a 5 foot 11 man with combed greasy brown hair. Before she died, Cecilia also reported to detectives a description of a man she saw watching them before he put on his mask, claiming he had dark brown hair that fell into his eyes, was white and had on dark sunglasses. Yes, yeah, so the thing about the wing walker shoe prints, the wing walker boots, they're a very particular shoe found in the military backgrounds and you can only buy them from certain stores on military um, property. This is a big kind of twist in the yeah, case. A massive piece of evidence. Yeah, so it's, it's that immediately goes, okay, he must have a military background um, and it helps kind of the FBI kind of figure out a kind of profile. And also there was reports later on from three young women who were at this uh, at the location as well and they reported the same thing I'm noticing a strange man kind of around the general area. They went to go sunbathe and basically yeah, someone were in a light blue Chevrolet two-door sedan with California plates pulled up to the rear of their car but remained inside his vehicle. Yeah, basically they, they, they reported seeing this guy who was kind of hanging around. They said that he was between 28 and 40 years old, 200 to 225 pounds, six foot tall, star black hair with rounded eyes and thin lips. So they're saying that he's about watching them from about 40 to 50 feet away. That's quite a vivid description. <laughs> he's got thin distance. lips. That's not something you remember, but they also say that he um, he was quite good looking with a muscular or stocky build, wearing dark trousers and a dark pullover shirt. Uh, one of the girls claimed he was wearing a short sleeve sweatshirt with a white belt, which interestingly, Brian claimed that the knife the attacker stabbed him with was tucked into a white belt as well. So it kind of collaborates that all together. But yeah, it's, so it's again like in the previous, in the first, in the first murder when he was stalking around that car park. Yeah, it wasn't a case of he he picked these people. It was just a random attack. He was yeah. probably trying to do it to them beforehand, but they got away, or maybe he had to he had to psych himself up a bit. That's another yeah. possible thing. Despite this being one of the most elaborate crimes, Zodiac had no communications with media to prove his link to this. It wouldn't be until his next crime that he would contact them with his claims. So again, that's a bit odd. He just needs to change his MO there, going like... Yeah. It seems just to me like this one sticks out as being very different. Yeah, it was also... There was, it wasn't quite broad daylight, but it was still they were completely different to, you know, 10pm, 11pm at night. Um, you know, an isolated car park. He's in a, uh, a national park, uh, six, you know, 5, 6pm. It's still yeah. going to be hot in it and yeah. bright. But he's still sticking, you know, if these are all connected to young couples, there seems to be something that he has in his mind or in his in his, in his his plans, something he has against young couples or wanting to claim. True, but then if he was stalking those people sunbathing, yeah, I don't know, maybe he wasn't, maybe he didn't have the intention to attack them, who knows, but um, it does seem, yeah, that seems to be fall into the category, doesn't it? So October 11th, 1969. Paul Stein, a 29-year-old yellow cab driver in San Francisco, started his shift at 8.45 p.m., taking a fare from Pier 64 to the San Francisco Air Terminal. Based on the meter in Paul's cab and the distance most likely to be travelled, he picked up his next fare somewhere around the Mason and Geary intersection, or Union Square. This is corroborated by Leroy Street, the assistant traffic manager of the yellow cab company who called in a fare after Paul had finished his first job of the evening. Next stop, Leroy Street. <laughs> it says his wife when he gets in for a kiss. He's like, that's five dollars, please. He's like, what? No tip? Here's a Not tip. tip. No, that. Um, don't, don't do the hand gesture. I didn't. I was just scratching my knee. No, you're, um, <clears throat> you'd be so lucky. Well, it's been a long time. Um, Paul had logged in Washington and Maple as the destination on his trip sheet, but had pulled up a few blocks away on Washington and Cherry Street at 9.55pm. When the cab stopped, the passenger shot Paul in the head at point-blank range with a semi-automatic pistol, killing him instantly. The killer then took Paul's wallet and keys and was seen by three child witnesses across the street using his shirt to wipe down the vehicle, presumably to remove any fingerprints or to mop up blood. These witnesses called the police and described a white male, 25 to 30 years old, 5 foot 8 to 5 foot 9, stocky build, reddish brown hair worn in a crew cut, heavy rimmed glasses and dark clothing. They last saw him casually walking north on Cherry Street. Unfortunately, the police dispatcher mistakenly described the suspect as being a black male adult in the initial report to officers attending the scene. So yeah, that's, I mean, mistakenly hearing that. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> a yes. white guy with ginger hair. It's a black guy. It's a black man. It just seems to be that is a huge error. Yeah. And so the police that were patrolling the area, they stopped a man who was near the scene, who was 
a white guy with glasses, and they basically said to him, because he wasn't didn't fit the description that they were given, had you seen a guy running around here with a gun? And he pointed the opposite direction and said, yes, there's a man, I saw a man running with a gun like, the opposite way. And so they actually believed that they perhaps stopped the Zodiac Killer and had their opportunity there, but because we were given the wrong information, they, they weren't able to stop him, which just seems to be the biggest, like... Yeah. I mean, at this at the same time, this particular murder is one of the more heavily argued one about whether or whether it wasn't the Zodiac. Mm. Um, obviously, it's completely out of his other MO in terms of... Yeah, but of, car, uh, car gun, I think. Car gun, yeah. I just think like as well, and then we'll go on to, to kind of why... I believe it, it was, but it it's just seems it could have all been answered there and then, and yeah. it's just shoddy police work. On the 14th of October 1969, the San Francisco Chronicle received a new letter along with a portion of bloody cloth. It soon became apparent that the cloth was part of Paul Stein's shirt, and the letter contained details and claimed responsibility of his murder. It read, This is the Zodiac speaking. I am the murder of the taxi driver over by Washington Street and Maple Street last night. To prove this, here is a bloodstained piece of his shirt. I am the same man who did in the people in the North Bay area. The San Francisco police could have caught me last night if they had searched the park properly instead of holding road races with their motorcycles seeing who can make the most noise. The car drivers should have parked their cars and sat there quietly waiting for me to come out of cover. School children make nice targets. I think I shall wipe out a school bus some morning. Just shoot out the front tyre and then pick off the kiddies as they come bouncing out. It was signed with the Zodiac symbol and confirmed that while police were mistakenly given the description of a black male adult, they may have inadvertently let the real Zodiac killer go. In response to the threats in the letter against school children, the police mobilised armed guards, the tracking of school buses, along with increased surveillance in the surrounding areas. This would go on for some months. Uh, one of the documentaries I watched, one of the girls, when they got to a certain um, railway crossing, they were all told to duck down because that's what they when they thought they were most vulnerable and they were stopped and they were stationary. And apparently this just became like an everyday thing for kids. The school buses, you were going to school. I'm sure they weren't told exactly why they were told and made yeah. to duck and whatnot. And interestingly, David Fincher, I think he as well was on the buses at that time and wow. he, had to, he knew of this you know, having to go through that daily for months on end. So well, it, it was it was so prominent in the media at the time as well. Like even during you know daytime television, there would be uh, either, either adverts or news segments about the Zodiac, where they'd be particularly graphic about what he had done mm. and the ciphers. Um, and the uh, the composite sketches, and obviously kids would see this at the same time, so some of them would be aware. But it's, can you imagine that? That's yeah, that's really horrible. Exactly. Yeah, it's it's, it's a very bizarre yeah, time in America, definitely, and like especially with all the kind of other public killings of people and celebrities yeah. and stuff like that. It just seemed to be crime was running rampant in America. It seemed at that time. The 20th of October, 1969, at 2 p.m., someone claiming to be the Zodiac called the Oakland Police Department requesting that one of the two prominent lawyers, F. Lee Bailey or Melvin Belly, appear on AM San Francisco, a talk show on KGO TV, hosted by Jim Dunbar. October 22nd, 1969. Melvin Belly appeared on Jim Dunbar's show and a man who named himself Sam called in, claiming to be the Zodiac Killer. Sam claimed he had headaches and had done since he was a child and that he would kill all those kids. This was basically during what was a predominantly one-sided conversation with Melvin Belly in which Belly was trying to find out more information about the Zodiac Killer uh, rather than Sam himself. During a private conversation off the air, Belly asked Sam to meet in person and suggested a church in Chinatown as the location. Sam reportedly replied, meet me on top of the Fairmont Hotel without anybody else or I'll jump. Does it seem to you as if uh you're pretty much on the verge of finding this man? Well, I wouldn't want to say that, uh, Dave. Uh, we're hoping. Uh, we've, we've got some good things working for us, but it takes time. Mm -hmm. And to be able to reach out and pluck this guy out of the air isn't done. Uh, uh, in most murder cases, you'll find a motive. But of course, this guy is just a killer, mm -hmm. uh, a mad killer, and you have no motive. So it makes it a little bit harder for us to track him down. It's also fairly obvious that the man greatly enjoys the publicity that surrounds this thing. And there's a chance that man could be watching this interview. That's true. What would you Very have to true. say to this man? Uh, 
about the only thing I could say to him uh, would, I think he realizes he needs help. I'm sure he does. And I'm sure he realizes what he's doing. And this is, uh, to me, uh, it's a sex crime. He's doing this for gratification. And I feel that he should definitely uh, seek aid. So there was actually police dispatchers who had heard the Zodiac's voice um, from the calls they received before. And they straight away said that this wasn't, you know, categorically definitely was not this guy, Sam, who rang the show. Yeah, so as well as that, there were the survivors, um, Mike and Brian, that also disputed this. So the phone call was actually believed to be Eric Weil, who was in the mental health facility. And who it was believed he was responsible for the hoax call to Jim Dunbar show. But it's still kind of, if you watch it, it's still very unnerving, isn't it? Oh, Thinking yeah. if, if yeah. perhaps this is actually the Zodiac Killer. The 8th of November, 1969, the San Francisco Chronicle received a card that has been named the Dripping Pen Card due to the image on the front, with a message on the back saying, This is the Zodiac speaking. I thought you would need a good laugh before you hear the bad news. You won't get the news for a while yet. P.S. Could you print this new cipher in your front page? I get awfully lonely when I'm ignored. So lonely that I could do my thing. Suggesting that the Zodiac was responsible for seven deaths in the months outlined in the letter. Along with the card was a fourth cipher, 340 symbols long, named the 340 cipher. This remained unsolved for over 50 years. And that is the timeline of the Zodiac. So we've got a lot more to be talking about in terms of who, who is the suspects, um, what some of the kind of conspiracy theories are, some other theories that we're going to go into. So very interested to see what Dr. Das has to say about him. You know, with a bit more professional eye than us and let us know what he thinks in terms of who could be behind the Zodiac killings. Hello, everybody. My name is Dr. Shaham Das. I'm a consultant, forensic psychiatrist and a YouTuber. So when I think about the Zodiac Killer case, especially the bits that stand out to me from a psychoanalytical perspective, the first thing that really strikes me, the most obvious thing, is the very fact that he used to send out these letters. And they're quite cryptic. There were little puzzles within them. So why did he do this? Well, to me, this is all about power. So most people who, who kill, especially serial killers, they obviously want to have power over their victims. But the Zodiac Killer, I think, is something different. He not just wanted power over his victims, but he had power and control over the police, over the press, which screams to me narcissism. He really wants to be infamous. And it also screams to me some sort of superiority complex, which always comes from an inferiority complex. So there's, there has to be a reason why he wants to feel that he's cleverer than other people. So I wonder whether something's happened to him in his childhood. So for example, maybe he had a more intelligent sibling and he was overlooked by his parents, or perhaps he failed exams and felt like a failure, or maybe he was like stuck in a job where he felt that his skills weren't being used and he was being underappreciated. The other thing that I'd say is that most people who would commit serial murders would be quite scared of being captured, but the Zodiac Killer was quite bold. He was almost taunting the police to try and uh, try and catch him, which just shows that he just is completely fearless and even brave to a degree. And also he thinks that he's so clever that he's not going to be caught. And I have to say, in this particular case, he was actually right. One of the things that he would say, the Zodiac Killer, in terms of his letters, was that he was collecting souls for the afterlife. And I think we'd all agree that's a really unusual thing to say. There's a possibility that this could be psychotic. So a psychosis is where you step outside of reality, either in the form of hearing voices or having bizarre, like delusional beliefs, bizarre beliefs. But I don't think that's the case with the Zodiac Killer because there's no indication that he was, he was out of touch of what was going on around him. Instead, I think what's going on is that he had this kind of morbid fascination with the afterlife and was just trying to use it to jazz up his letters to a degree. There's a theory that the Zodiac Killer might have suffered from multiple personality disorders. And the reason for that theory is because he didn't really have a consistent MO. His killings were very different. At times they were organised, so, you know, pre-planned, and at times they seemed disorganised, where they were quite impulsive and reckless and emotional. So I think that's the reason that, there's this, that this theory exists, but I personally don't subscribe to that, and I'll tell you why. Multiple personality disorder is, is a, quite a, an often misunderstood mental disorder. In reality, the people who suffer from it, well, first of all, it's very rare, and the people who suffer from it 
tend to have a long history of trauma. So they have repeated horrific traumas, like, for example, multiple sexual abuse as children. And they tend to have very chaotic and disorganized lives. Quite frequently, they spend a lot of their adult life in and out of psychiatric hospital. That doesn't ring true to the Zodiac Killer to me, because he actually seems quite well organized to, to have committed this many murders over such a long period of time and have gotten away with it. To me, that sounds like somebody who, who knows what he's doing, who's able to plan carefully um, and go through his actions without detection. Another thing that really strikes me from the Zodiac Killer is that he went after couples on occasion. Not all of his victims, but many of his victims were couples. And you got to wonder why that was. Surely it's not just a coincidence. So I wonder whether he is the victim of unrequited love or if he was spurned at some point in his romantic career. So maybe he's jealous of other couples because for whatever reason he couldn't get into a loving relationship. Either he didn't have any kind of relationships at all, or maybe he did, but he wasn't particularly happy in them. And somebody who talks once the police like this, obviously they have quite narcissistic traits. So they love being the center of attention as well as feeling uh, su superior intellectually. So it's likely that if, if you met the Zodiac Killer in person, he probably comes across as uh, not just self-assured, but probably quite arrogant as well. So I hope that was uh, interesting and informative. If, you, if you're interested in this kind of area, my YouTube channel, A Psych for Sore Minds, covers the crossover between mental illness and offending. So I dissect high profile cases like this one. I talk about my individual patients at times, although I anonymize them, or sometimes I just talk about generic kind of areas and topics related to offending or related to criminality or mental illness. Okay, until next time, thanks for listening and let's head back over to Tom and Ben. So a massive thank you and a massive welcome to Dr. Das. Uh, we're really looking forward to hearing his take on the uh, the upcoming 11 episodes in the series. Um, and please go ahead and subscribe to his channel if you haven't already. So before we jumped into the timeline, we mentioned three other possible Zodiac uh, victims. There are an additional two uh, that occurred after uh, the timeline finished. So the first one of which is on the 6th of September 1970. And this is regarding 25-year-old Donna Lass. So the interesting thing about this one is that she was actually uh, she actually vanished in Nevada, which was slightly out of the MO of, of the Zodiac. And this is one of the reasons why it's quite contested, whether she was or wasn't a, a victim of the Zodiac. She worked as a nurse at the Sahara, her last entry in the nurse's logbook was at 1.50 a.m. And although her car was found parked at her apartment complex in the nearby state line, she wasn't seen after leaving the Sahara. The next day, an unknown male called her landlord and her employer, stating that Lass wouldn't be returning due to a family emergency. The call was ruled as a hoax and there has been no trace of Lass ever since. Nothing solid connects Lass to the Zodiac other than perhaps the fact that she was living just a few blocks from the scene of the Zodiac's murder of Paul Stein, uh, the taxi driver in San Francisco. A postcard bearing an advertisement for Forest Pines Condominiums, which was near an incline village in Lake Tahoe, was sent to the San Francisco Chronicle on March the 22nd, 1971, under the guise of the Zodiac. Even if the Zodiac was responsible for the last postcard, it is still not proof that he had abducted and murdered her. His MO does vary a lot, yeah, but him doing a fake call saying like he's, you won't see her she go and see her family and stuff like that that seems to be very different yeah, yeah. and he's not because he's not calling media outlets and doing that he's calling the work in order for to buy time it seems if anything so the other one is 22 year old Kathleen Johns uh, and this one is the one that really was to revert back to the movie again a haunting watch in the movie so Kathleen was allegedly abducted on March the 22nd of 1970 on highway 132 in an area west of Modesto Kathleen escaped from the car of a man who drove her and her infant daughter around the area between Stockton and Patterson for approximately an hour and a half so basically what had happened is a car was following her um, it f was flashing and beeping for her to pull over it's in the dark as well, which is even more bizarre. This this anonymous man then pulls up beside her and states, your your real your rear offside wheel is loose and it's shaking. Um, do you want me to fix it for you? She's got a newborn, she's on her own. She says yes. Now allegedly, instead of fixing the wheel, he loosens it. And a couple of miles further on, she starts uh, driving. The the wheel completely falls off, and then he pulls up and says, "Oh wow, it must have you know it must have been worse than I thought." Do you want to ride to the nearest um, service station? In which she then gets in to the car with him, and a few miles into the journey, he turns to her and says, 
I'm going to throw your baby out the window before I kill you. She freaks out. She jumps out of the car and ha- with her baby and hides then. Um, and the guy is never seen again. She's actually picked up um, and, and she survives. Um, there's a really powerful witness statement and she states that there were similarities in obviously his approach, the area. It is obviously the following year from the previous mm. Zodiac murder, but it's just there's a lot of kind of similarities there. Late at night, car from behind. Um, that's about it. Yeah. So, uh, I guess you could say there's a couple of similarities. Yeah, which are very... Again, he wouldn't mess about, would he? He would just shoot her. Yeah. The first time she pulls over from what he'd done for previous things. Yeah, Pretty but I, I, it's, a, it's, it's argued that he didn't realise she had a baby when he did everything. And then once she got in the car with a baby, she was like, ah. He was like, ah, got a baby. And they said, I'm going to throw it out before I kill you. Yeah, it, yeah. It turns him a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. When she gave her statement to the sergeant on duty, she noticed that the police composite sketch of the uh, killer of the taxi driver, Paul Stein, she basically felt that the composite sketch was very, very similar to the individual that had abducted her and her child. Apparently, they drove past several kind of service stations and the guy wasn't stopping as well. So it's just a horrible set of circumstances. Most accounts say that the man threatened to kill Johns and her daughter uh, while driving them around, but at least one police report disputes that. She also then would go to Paul Avery of the Chronicle um, and indicates that her abductor left his car and searched for her in the dark with a flashlight. However, one report she made to the police, she stated that he did not leave the vehicle. So she could be kind of discredited slightly in changing her story. Yeah, as well, it goes through, you know, different people's accounts and getting more elaborate and people that are probably wanting to tie as closer to the Zodiac would change certain elements to it. It's yeah. just one of those, isn't it, where the stories can kind of vary. If you read the direct police report, I'm sure it... Yeah, and then her kind of pulling out the fact that it, it, in some reports he left the car and searched with her with a torch, and then in other statements she said mm. that he stayed in the car as well, He's trying to get another similarity, the torch. Um, back then, just a simple on and off button. Nowadays, uh, most of them are LED, so get strobe lighting and disco. Strobiac. Killer. No. The other kind of uh, reason why Kathleen John's abduction and not quite attempted murder, but the abduction is linked to the Zodiac is that in July of 1970, the Zodiac took credit for Kathleen John's abduction four months after the incident. Basically, he'd stated that he went on an interesting journey with a mother and a baby. So again, it could it could have been another journey, but yeah, people linked it with Kathleen John's. Yeah, there seemed to be some more correspondence between the Zodiac and, and, and the paper and stuff. And um, written on one of the cards was, I hope you enjoy yourselves when I have my blast, followed by Zodiac's cross circle signature. On the back of the card, the Zodiac threatened to use the bus bomb soon unless the newspaper published the full details that he had written. He also wanted to see people wearing some some nice Zodiac buttons. Branding. Yeah. And on June 26th, 1970, the Zodiac stated that he was upset that he did not see people wearing Zodiac buttons. He wrote, I shot a man sitting in a parked car with 38, which may have referred to a police officer shot. It's hard to tell because this could be just letters from, you know, anyone claiming all these different things because before like, kind of looking really into this case it seemed to be very thought out and very thorough yeah and when you start looking into all the details and putting it all out in front of you it seems to be a lots of very manic with the kind of very messy yeah another big thing that happened was on to- october 27th 1970 the chronicle reporter paul avery who had been covering the zodiac case so he, he was documented in the film the zodiac as well he's a, he is basically the one heavily linked with this whole case and he wrote went on to write a book about it as well and um, he received a halloween card signed with a letter z and the Zodiac's cross circle signal and written inside the card was the note peekaboo you are doomed so after receiving that letter obviously he was quite shaken up and a bit worried um, he then made people in the Chronicle wear I'm not Paul Avery badges uh, yeah. which I think is him poking fun at the fact that the Zodiac buttons didn't happen <laughs> so it's just kind of like it, it, it's quite yeah he seems to have quite a lot of moxie does he, Paul yeah he also wore that badge himself and uh, yeah another letter which again this just it's <laughs> In January 29th, 1974, there's a letter praising The Exorcist um, as the best satirical comedy that he'd ever seen. The letter included a snippet of a verse from the Mikado, an unusual symbol at the bottom that that has remained unexplained by researchers. Um, Zodiac concluded the letter was a new score, me equals 37, 
SFPD equals zero, suggesting that he had now killed 37 people. Yeah, I wonder if he thought The Martian was a comedy. So as we mentioned at the end of the timeline, the 340 cipher um, would go on for almost 50 years to be unsolved. However, David Oranchak started working on deciphering it in 2006. Oranchak worked with the Australian mathematician Sam Blake and Belgian computer programmer Jarl van Eyck. Interesting group of guys. Blake came up with 650,000 variations of the cipher, and those were plugged into a code-breaking program written by Van Eyck. Earlier on in the journey, he partially deciphered the message, finding phrases such as gas chamber and I hope you are having lots of fun in trying to catch me. It was officially decrypted on December 5th of 2020 by the team and confirmed as authentic by the FBI. So that's a big investment from those guys. 14 years it took them, um, but they cracked it. This is the confirmed um, cipher decryption. Uh, We'll get producer Dan to read now. I hope you are having lots of fun in trying to catch me. That wasn't me on the TV show, which brings up a lot of points about me. I am not afraid of the gas chamber, because it will send me to paradise all the sooner. Because I now have enough slaves to work for me, where everyone else has nothing when they reach paradise. So, they are afraid of death. I'm not afraid. Life will be an easy one in paradise. So on January 29th, um, 1970, the Yellow Cab Company, which was Paul Stein's employer, actually put up a $1,000 reward for any information leading to the arrest of the Zodiac Killer. This news was likely what prompted the Zodiac Killer to open one of his letters with the words, I am mildly curious as to how much money you have on my head now. Obviously, we've heard from Dr. Das about, you know, what kind of characteristics make up the Zodiac Killer and what kind of traits we're looking for here. So now we're going to go through some of the suspects and kind of see if they line up along with these people as well i mean the list out there is endless of the amount of different people that were either considered ruled out still ongoing but the two most predominant zodiac suspects are arthur lay allen and gary francis post so we'll start with arthur lay allen so this is the one that the the movie kind of focuses and kind of points the finger at david fincher's movie uh, is very kind of uh, biased towards the Zodiac Killer being Arthur Lay Allen. I mean, there are arguments for and against why it might be him. So Arthur Lay Allen is regarded as one of the, well, one of, if not the prime suspect to have been the Zodiac Killer. The authorities began investigating him after they were told by one of his old co-workers that Allen had told him about an idea he had for a novel about a serial killer who called himself Zodiac and did several things the Zodiac Killer did or friend threatened to do, such as taping a flashlight to his gun and killing passengers of a school bus. Though this story has been met with some scepticism in the present since Alan was accused of molesting one of the individual's sons. Yeah, so with this as well, because I've watched a documentary on this and essentially everything lines up so nicely to the point where you're like, yeah, it's just... And also it was kind of speculated at the time when Mike and Darlene were shot, obviously there's a torch and then the gunshot the, the torch was taped to the gun apparently Arthur Lee showed his friends you know taping the torch to the gun how yeah. you know where you sh- if you shoot exactly where the torch was pointed it would be where the sight is essentially so all these things do line up very nicely there another thing is that um, Arthur Lee who was given by his mother a Zodiac watch he's kind of flaunting there around his friends even asking if she, if she stiffed him and bought him a crap watch or a good watch um, if you look on now they're quite expensive now Zodiac watches but on that has the the, the logo of which the, the killer will go on to use. Another big reason why people suspect Alan is that he was uh, interviewed by John Lynch of the Vallejo Police Department because he was reported to have been seen in the vicinity of the Lake Berryessa attack against Hartnell and Shepherd. So it was around the similar area of the National Park. Because there's actually his photos of him being at the lake before. Yeah. He was, he was a keen like diver but he'd also admitted to having bloody knives in his car on that weekend of the stabbing but claimed that the blood came from a chicken he had killed for dinner a warrant for his trailer and handwriting was secured and carried out and the results were inconclusive and alan was let go yeah, the one I mean, thing about him was ambidextrous apparently so when he was because when he was, he was young he was he was left-handed and apparently that's looked down on or thought to yeah. be quite odd so his mum forced him to learn to write with his right hand so he was actually able to use both hands so it's kind of been speculated when he was doing his handwriting tests 
whether or not he kind of just feigned, you know, and, and played around with it. Yeah. I mean, also, as they had searched his trailer, there it, there was a, it was a very strange sight. So they found lots of dead animals, uh, animal remains kept in his fridge as well. I mean, it could just be, it be a fan of hunting, but apparently it was quite an unkempt environment. And But well, uh, we all know what the abuse of animals usually leads to yeah, as well. exactly, yeah. Yeah, so, so when he received the watch was in 1969. That's when things were all, you know, all starting to kick off. In 1991, Mike McGow was tracked down and shown a lineup of old photos of Zodiac suspects after he identified Alan as the killer. I mean, that's quite a, a big that's one. That's big, yeah. Um, why didn't they do more with that? Mm, they asked McGow why he had never identified Alan in the 20 years that Alan had been the top suspect. And McGow said he had never been shown any pictures of suspects and he had only been asked if he recognised certain names. In 20 years? That is a huge blunder. Jesus. Surviving victim Brian Hartnell identified also his voice and physical appearance as being similar to the Zodiac. I mean, there's a lot of big fingers being pointed at Alan right now. Yeah, the same, he owned the same kind of, like, kind of a gun as a Zodiac, um, who was dishonorably discharged from the Navy, which obviously, as we said before, with the boots, it lines up with how we've owned in the boots. The big thing was his fingerprints didn't match what was believed to be belong to the killer. But like we said, like where they get these fingerprints from, they get yeah, them from a public place. Yeah, public places. I mean, the letters, I know they uh, will, go, will go on to use some saliva from, from the stamps. But I, was, I mean, I was watching um, Paul O'Grady for Love of Dogs the other day, and... Uh, he did a bit where he was licking an envelope and he gave it to the dog to lick. And then uh, you could just do that with the stamps. I'm not saying that's definitely what they did with the stamps of the Zodiac. Again, yeah, we that can't could, rule that, it out at the that same could time. be. Yeah. Oh my God, the Zodiac killer. It was spot. <laughs> I watched a documentary on on him, which I do recommend. It's, it's very fascinating. It's just on YouTube. And he would go on to say this line, which I thought it was quite interesting. Because he's basically been interviewed by a lot of news reporters and he was saying how much of a toll this has taken on his life. How you know he's always getting getting questioned very oddly lit very dramatically lit he's kind of in the darkness in in maybe he'd want to say, try and uh, hide his identity but um he would say there are two types of liars in the world fishermen and policemen the other thing quite big thing that would lead people to uh believe it was him was alan was born on december 18th around the same time the zodiac told attorney melvin belly's housekeeper over the phone that it was his birthday and he needed to kill someone and Alan would go on to die of heart failure in 1992 at the age of 58. A lot of evidence pointing towards Alan, but I still feel like is the is the biggest victory if if let's say it was Alan and he's taken this to his grave and not told anyone. Like when we covered the the Las Vegas shoot in the Stephen Paddock case, mm. we, there was no obviously or well, allegedly no kind of letter or information left, and that was just he took his motive and when you know knew his identity but he took his reasons for what he did to the grave with this you're not only taking your reasons and your motive but you're also taking your identity to the grave mm. where's the win in all of this i don't know it's, it, i mean he, as i said like with with him being very egotistical you would have thought that he would leave something to, to claim it was him yeah. all along but or is the ultimate win in going to the grave knowing that you got away with it and no one will ever know but then why did he need to constantly be put in the paper and be and be kind of rewarded yeah. for it yeah so another person who suspected was Earl Van Best. There's there actually a Sky Crime documentary that was out in 2021 about this. Basically, his son, Gary Stewart, um, he did a bit of research into his dad, uh, Earl Van Best, and he came across a picture which was the spitting image of the, um, the mock-up for the Zodiac Killer. This whole series documentary followed him in, into his journey there and all this. Some certain things that yeah did kind of line up very nicely to do with his, his father but he, looking at the ciphers with, with um his theories it basically lined up very nicely with his dad being being the perpetrator he also had a wedding certificate where the handwriting was said by certain uh, experts that they matched up with the um with the cipher and with the letters though this the whole documentary you watch it and you're really going oh my god this is actually the guy and at the very end it's like oh the wedding certificate was actually written by the vicar you're like oh really kind of uh, yeah. and then he's like no it's, it's st honestly it's still well no that's your main bit of evidence there and your dad wore glasses but we'll put the picture up it does it does obviously he his dad does look the spitting image it's worth a watch but disappointing so going back to September of 2021, uh, Gary Francis Post was revealed by a team of casebreakers to have been the Zodiac Killer. They tried to confirm it as him. Yeah, the casebreakers are a group of former cops, military intelligence officers and journalists. Yeah, and they would go on to identify Gary Francis Post as a Zodiac Killer. So the, for all the different bits and pieces that we, we've kind of looked through, the main piece of evidence that they're kind of clinging to, there was a scar on Post's forehead that basically matched, identically matched, a composite sketch of the Zodiac 
I see. When I looked at the sketch, I just thought that was like just family just, lines. Just, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, he's also a former U.S. Air Force veteran, which again would explain the boots. At one of the crimes early on, the Joe Bates one, which you know we're kind of loosely linking, thinking perhaps it's linked. There was a, a paint spattered wristwatch collected at the scene, and Post was a house painter at that time, and a footprint that seemed to match both Post and the Zodiac killer um, was found there as well. Yeah. Additionally, uh, the team of Codebreakers think Post is the Zodiac killer because of the typed confession that was mailed a month after Bates's murder. Uh, this is because the 1966 confession and a handwritten Zodiac letter from 1970 both misspelled the word Twitch the same way. It feels loose, doesn't it? I mean, the yeah. police haven't gone on to confirm this. Yeah, the FBI have um, outright denied it. Another theory that I found interested was the people thought it was Ted Kaczynski. The convicted yeah. Unibomber, um, because yeah. they share certain characteristics, you know, same kind of, the very into the kind of being very cryptic. He was actually, I know Ted left his job at the university a few months before the killing started to happen. But yeah, people went on to say that you know, they just didn't line up, it didn't, didn't make sense, it wasn't. This. Ted had a very clear MO. Yes. Yeah. And he was very precise. Whereas this one, as I said, it seems to be very kind of pinball-y. Yeah, definitely. There, there were some people that also believed it to be the work of multiple people or the work of a cult and very kind of Manson family-esque. And in fact, all male members of the, uh, the Manson family were interviewed, but um, no further kind of actions were taken um, in relation to the Zodiac killings. There are people that believe, uh, there are groups of people and conspiracy theorists that believe it's all a hoax and that there's no... Uh, Zodiac killer whatsoever so there is the Zodiac hoax theory and that it was basically uh, perpetrated by members of law enforcement and also a government cover up um, there's loads of information out there on that if you want to have a read up on that but I mean they interviewed tons of different people and tons of different people have been kind of um, mentioned as, as responsible so a bit of trivia on this talking about David Fincher's Zodiac and one really interesting thing here which I mean you can't really take this as too much of a of a clue but so Nancy Slover the Vallejo operator who took the first Zodiac call they were very keen in the Zodiac film to use you know be as close to the story as possible and be you know line things up as as much as they could who took the first Zodiac call was asked to help provide voice direction by selecting audio recordings or readings by various unidentified actors so after selecting the recording that sounded closest to the Zodiac it was revealed that she selected a reading by John Carroll Lynch who plays the prime suspect in the film Arthur Lee Allen that's just a yeah, it's nice, but it doesn't it's mean nice anything. It doesn't mean anything. Yeah. But it, it's uh, yeah, as I said before, David Fincher recalled how, as a child, he came home from school one day after noting how a police car had been following his bus. His father replied, "Oh yeah, there's a serial killer who's killed four or five people who calls himself the Zodiac. He's threatened to take a high-powered rifle and shoot out the tires of a school bus and then shoot the children as they come off the bus." <laughs> Some reassurance not from the father yeah, there. Not mentioning his words. Dirty Harry was also based on Zodiac. When the villain calls himself the Scorpio Killer in the Seven Psychopaths movie, which is a great film, by the way. Yep. The Zodiac Killer makes a brief appearance in a flashback, presented as a hippie who lives with a number of white rabbits and pl displays a Gundy poster on his wall. And apparently in the new Batman film to come out, the Riddler is based on the Zodiac Killer with a similar costume, symbol, and the use of Halloween greeting card to taunt someone. Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a lot of modern culture has been absorbed by it people affected by it. America's Most Wanted aired an episode on the different suspects likely to be the Zodiac Killer and this was mainly based around the 2010 revelation of an image of Zodiac victim Darlene Ferrin together with an unknown man who to this date still can't be accounted for. They don't know who he is. Well that reflect goes with the oh never mind doesn't it? Yeah and I mean we'll pop it up. He looks exactly like the composite but it's quite a vague composite even then. Yeah, I'm going to get on to how vague it is. Oh, perfect. Uh, um, he basically has glasses and short hair. Um, police believe the photo was taken in San Francisco in the middle of 1966 or 1967. The man could not be accounted for or named to this date. Yeah, lots. I mean, we're leaving this very open-ended as, I mean, I don't think anyone thought we were going to solve this. It's a very, very interesting case. There's so many documentaries, so many like in-depth podcasts just covering yep. this over episode of an episode. It's a highly recommend if you want to learn any more. 
go check it out. Check out the film as well. It is excellent. Oh, yeah, there's so much to this case, and that's why it fascinates so many people. Yeah, there uh, are online communities like still investigating it to this day. There is a, a a very good website if you have the time that goes into a lot more kind of micro detail than what we're able to kind of within an hour or so. And it's a website called zodiacciphers.com, which is managed by a guy called Richard from Coventry. But he basically goes in depth into every single calling card, every single letter, every single cipher, all of the evidence at the scene. Like, And it's a very well put together website. So if you have got the time, he also does his own analysis on each potential suspect. It's definitely worth a check out. Zodiacciphers.com. Also, his name was Arthur Lee Allen on YouTube. It's a documentary that I watched, which had all his friends. Oh, well, his old friends, basically. <laughs> saying it was him um, but that's very interesting just to hear kind of and see and just see what they're saying about all as I said it's very biased in terms of trying to make it out that he definitely was the person but it's definitely worth a watch but we're, we're coming to the, the end of this episode of the first case we hope you guys enjoyed it thank you again to Gully Garms Dead Happy and our resident doctor Dr Das and let us know who you think you know out of the suspects you know was it multiple people was this all done with the same killer um, let us know your thoughts we were very interested to hear it but like we always we always like to do we like to have a little light relief at the end here some lookalikes and this mm. I've, I've come bearing many a lookalike this week but I'm very interested to see Ben what you've got as well gone out there it was hard obviously with a uh, no clear killer yeah uh, to do an exact lookalike my first one is the black knight from Monty Python's Holy Grail um, <laughs> it's pretty spot on um, the emblems are slightly different, but it's pretty much yeah, bang on that. So my first one was the composite sketch, and I've gone with um, Roy Scheider from Jaws. Pretty good the forehead. It is the forehead. See, like, that's why I thought it was frown lines. Yeah, um, yeah. it's, it's There's someone who is I can't figure I out who think I'm thinking who of. I've, I don't think it's who I've got. I okay, know I know you're hoping it is. Go on. The composite sketch I have got Paul Dano and from There Will Be Blood. Definitely not that. No. No. No, but that's not bad. Just a guy with glasses. Well, the next one I've got is is for um, Lee Allen. Okay, yeah. I've got Sean Williamson, Barry from EastEnders. The photo you've He's used. He's literally just the photo I've used. It doesn't really look like him. It's just the angle of the face and. It, it's good though. It's, it's quite good. Just to go back to the uh, the drawing of uh, in his full Zodiac gear, um, I've gone with Lord Buckethead. Yep, that's solid. Uh, which is probably a little bit better than um, the Black Knight. A little bucket. Yeah, the last one I've got is um, it's uh, from Gary French's post, and I've gone with Michael J. Fox. Pretty good. So I've made a meme for this case just because I think uh, I saw a picture and I thought this is uh, <laughs> too good to not make. Uh, just to, this kind of is taking the piss out of how much everyone looks like this guy. <laughs> <laughs> so for the listeners it's literally the detective who's work, one of the detectives working <laughs> on the case looking at the composite which looks exactly like him oh shit very good <laughs> oh shit uh, we'll it's pop that up but yeah it, it, it's such a, a vague composite really isn't it <laughs> yeah that's a fascinating case to start with um, lots of you know I'm sure people have screamed the screams why didn't you mention this or oh I really liked how they mentioned that I didn't expect them to mention it. Yeah, a massive thank you once again. Uh, it's really good to be back. Um, if you can't wait until next week's episode and, and the week after and the week after and the week after, why not head over to patreon.com forward slash pod. 50 plus episodes over there. We've got a Christmas quiz on there. It's a bit late, but if you fancy a quiz that's Christmas themed in January, February, it's on YouTube as well. There's some extra bits in the Patreon uh, that you will never see on YouTube. So never. that's also a perk. Um, as well as that, by supporting us on Patreon, you unlock a special discount for our store. And we've got some nice, new, exciting items over there. We so have a candle. We have a candle. No one expected it. No. Uh, we worked with Natural Leah, uh, a good friend of the podcast. And yeah, we're very excited to bring that out. And it's, it's all natural sense as well. It's mm. not anything synthetic. It's, it's all legit. So be sure to check that out. Just line up someone's day and buy them a candle. Yeah, there you go. Uh, we have some other new items uh, that have been very heavily requested coming uh, out in the store, um, you know, in the not too distant future. So please keep your eyes peeled. And if you want to keep in the loop about stuff like that, then we have socials. We have Instagram, Twitter, Facebook. Um, the first two are at Could Murder a Pod and Facebook. Just search. Just search it. Just search us and we'll pop up. And yep. th that's getting a bit lively now. Yes, the, the community over there is kicking off. 
as I've been known to say. But anyway, guys, we're very pumped to be back. Very excited to bring you the 11 other cases. And uh, until next time, Ben, like we always say... We say this all the time. Keep doing... <laughs> what you doing? Uh, unless it's uh, strapping torches to guns. Ciphers. So stop with the ciphers already. Roundabout loving. Ciphers is never going to catch on. Stop with the ciphers. Doesn't work. <laughs> Take care, guys. Fetch. Mean girls. Huh. Stop trying to make cipher happen. That was the point. Yeah. Okay. See you guys. Have you seen Mo Mean Girls? <laughs> Seriously. Okay, I'll watch it. We wear pink. Is that what they say? The plastics. Plastic. Shut the fuck up. <laughs> Fourth of July, nineteen sixty-nine. Darlene Ferrin, a twenty-two-year-old married woman, and Mike McGoo, McGo, Goo, go, go. Mike McGo, McGoo, <coughs> MacGyver. <laughs>